Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. For those of you who do not know, Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew and today I'm going to be reading one story for you. I'll be reading uh, Perception by Alan Dean Foster. If you enjoyed today's story and would like to join us next time, uh, Word of Mouth is broadcast on the first and third Thursday of every month um, at 12.10 p.m. Central Time. Uh, you can access it here on the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library's Facebook page. Uh, that's at MCCPL Morgan, uh, live at that time, or you can watch it later um, on the Montgomery City County Library's YouTube page, um, which is uploaded later that day. I believe that's all the announcements I have for today, so let's get on to our story. Perception by Alan Dean Foster Stefan didn't want the assignment to Aurelis. He didn't want to work at the outpost. He'd seen pictures of Aurelis and the outpost and the Alouette natives and found all of them unpleasant in equal measure. But advancing up the company ladder meant climbing the rungs in order, skipping one now and then if you were fortunate. For a young apprentice such as himself, Aurelis was a rung that couldn't be skipped. So it was that he found himself installed for a year at the outpost, a self-contained subdivision of the larger Aurelis station, set in the middle of a swamp. It could as easily have been anywhere on Aurelis except at the poles. Swamp or savanna, take your choice. That they were covered nearly all of Aurelis except for the murky algae-colored oceans. Of the two, the savannas offered the more pleasant prospect with drier, cooler weather. Unfortunately, humans weren't the only ones who preferred the plains to the swamps. So did the several dozen species of ferocious, biting anthropods that drained bodily fluids without discriminating between planet of origin. The Alouat got around the swamps on primitive flat rafts fashioned from fiber thrush and kavango saplings fastened together with strong red luporio vine. Ages ago, some Alouette Einstein had figured out that if you build the rafts with points at both ends, not only would they go faster through the tepid, turgid water, but you wouldn't have to turn them around to reverse direction. That discovery represented the height of Alouette nautical technology. The idea of a sail was beyond them, ignoring directives that forbade supplying indigenous aliens with advanced knowledge. Visiting humans who observed the locals struggling with poles and paddles had taken pity on them and introduced the concept of the rudder, an innovation that the natives readily adopted and for which they were inordinately grateful. To the outpost, Alwood brought the pleasures and treasures of the Irelis Highlands, unique organic gem material, seeds from which exotic spices were extracted, sustainable animal products, barks and resins and flowers from which were derived uniquely unsynthesizable pharmaceuticals, and their own unfashionable primitive handicrafts. Widely scattered and hard to find, located in disagreeable, dangerous country, these diverse products of Irelis found their way into the insatiable current of interstellar trade through the good offices of the dirt, literally poor natives. Everyone benefited, and the Commonwealth government was happy. Stefan was not happy. He did not quite hate Aurelis, but he disliked the place intensely. The swamp, for one. There was nothing in the way of entertainment. Worst of all was having to work with the locals. None of the Alouettes stood taller than a meter in height, if you could call it standing. In the absence of anything resembling legs or feet, it was hard to tell. They slimed their way along, their listless pace in perfect harmony with their sluggish metabolisms. A quartet of narrow but strong tentacles protruded from their cephalopodian upper bodies. These were covered in fine, hairless, slick skin, not unlike that of a frog or a salamander. From the center of the upper bulge, that was not quite a proper head, two large, round eyes marked by crescent-shaped pupils took in the swamp that was their world. They had no external ears, no fur or horns, and they wore no clothing. Not that there was much to show. When they burbled at one another in their rudimentary, vowel-rich language, bubbles frothed at the corners of their lipless mouths. They had no proper teeth and subsisted on a wide variety of soft plant life, supplementing this 
with, a white, with the occasional freshwater mollusk that did not require overmuch chewing. Soon after arriving, Stefan had had the opportunity to see them eat. It was not a pretty sight. It did not take him long to learn that from his three co-workers that the Alawalt were as oblivious to human sarcasm as they were to much of the world around them. Making fun of the slow-moving, slow-thinking natives was one of the few spontaneous entertainments available to the outpost inhabitants. Except when a supervisor came visiting. It was a sport they indulged in shamelessly, taking care to not do so out of the range of the station's largely humorless scientific compliment. But by the time Stefan's tour of duty was half over, his own personal file of Alabot jokes had grown as fat as one of the natives. Not that they were inherently unlikable, he mused as he blazed his way through his daily turn at the trading counter. On his right was a projector that could magically, as far as the Alouette were concerned, generate a three-dimensional, rotatable image of anything in the outpost warehouse. Visiting natives who made endless demands of the device simply for its entertainment value soon found themselves cut out of the trade loop. Once word spread among the local clans, this abuse stopped. The outpost, they learned, was a place in which to conduct serious trade. The tripartite clan was now leaving carried between them several parcels sealed in the ubiquitous biodegradable plastic wrap that was used to package all trade goods. As he watched them depart, Stefan directed the room's air purifier to grade up a notch. Alouette body odor was no more pleasant than their appearance. In a few minutes, the atmospheric scrubber would have removed the last lingering traces of the clan's visit. Purvisatha waited for the cheerful, noisily bubbling farm family to exit before coming in. Despite his special cooling gear, he was sweating profusely. A number of visiting supervisors and scientists felt that it would have been a better name for the planet, sweating profusely. It was certainly more descriptive than Irelis IV. Got something for you, Steph? Perv, as his friends and co-workers called him, leaned on the counter. The corners of his mouth twitched. He seemed to be striving hard to repress a grin. Not another carved orris tooth. Stefan eyed the other young man warily. They're pretty, but we've already got a box full. <laughs> nope, better than that. The grin escaped its bounds. Perv gestured towards the door. Enter. Come inside. The native slid slowly inward on the familiar, disgusting trail of lubricating gunk. Behind it, the floor did its best to clean up after the visitor. Unfeeling mechanical though it was, Stefan still felt sorry for the auto cleaner. Unlike the rest of them, it would never look forward to a day off. Not on Aurelis. Perf's grin was wider than ever. You remember that directive? Not last week's, the, the one before. Page 12. All company outmosts must strive where possible to encourage local life forms to participate in the ongoing activities of a given station with regard to maintaining and enhancing benign relations between the human and native populations. Yeah, Stefan replied guardedly. I remember it, so what? He slapped at his forehead, smashing something small, irritating, and resistant to the cocktail of insecticides that he had liberally applied earlier. Perf gestured grandly at the newcomer, who was gazing around at the interior of the station with eyes that were even wider than normal. Meet your new native assistant. Stefan blanched, recovered when he thought it was a joke. Eyed his friend in disbelief when it began to sink in that it was not. Don't try to be funny today, Perv. It's too hot today. And it'll be too hot tomorrow, and the day after that, and the one after that also. But this is still your new assistant. Maury says so. Screw Maury. As if the native were not present, Stefan gestured in its direction. We don't have indigenous assistants. No local works inside the outpost. We do now. Maury perf shot back. They do now. The other man's eyes narrowed. Then where's your assistant? Regulations only say at this point in the outpost development, we only need one. She's it. She's yours. His smile flattened. Lack of seniority says so. She? 
A dubious Stefan studied the lumpish native, who continued to ignore the two young humans as she gawked at the interior of the trading room. I thought the biologist hadn't figured out how to sex them yet. Perv stood away from the counter. Far as I know, they haven't. But that's a classification I've been given. He winked and turned to go. I'll leave you two alone now. The other man gestured wildly. Wait a minute. What am I supposed to do with, with this? With... Her? Perv kept walking. Not my concern. Maury says she's your new assistant. Get her to assist. Me, I got work to do on the bromide concentrator or the delay will go down on my record. He exited at a brisk clip, not looking back. Stefan was once again alone in the room. Well, not quite. Maybe if he ignored the native, it would go away. Sitting back down, he muttered the unpaused command and resumed watching the game he had been engrossed in prior to the trading clan's arrival. Images danced in the air half a meter in front of his eyes. After a while, he became aware that he was not alone. As was often the case, it was the smell that tipped him off. Advancing silently on its sheet of motive slime, the alouette had sidled up as close behind him as it dared, and was dutifully gazing at images whose origin meaning, and purpose must be as alien to it as tooth gel. Nostrils flaring in revulsion, he looked over his shoulder and down at the creature. Maury had declared it was his new assistant. Until he could make the notoriously gruff outpost administrator see reason, Stefan realized with a sinking feeling that he was probably stuck with the creature. But, fortunately, he told himself not to it. If he abused it physically, there would be trouble. Members of the station's scientific contingent, who infrequently mixed with the much younger and less experienced team of trader apprentices, would report him. His advancement up the company ladder would be questioned, and he might even be dropped down a rating or two. That could not be allowed to happen. Not after the horrid half-year he had already been forced to put in on Aurelis. Swallowing his distaste, he asked in Terran glow, Do you have a name? The dumpy alien quivered as if trying to slough off its skin. Flesh-protecting mucus oozed from pores and slid down its sides. I am chosen Uluk. At least he could talk a little, Stefan thought. Come to think of it, the staff would not have selected one to work inside the station with humans, unless it had acquired at least some some facility with the visitor's language. Then something happened that completely broke his train of thought. Raising a tentacle, the alouette pointed at the hovering wordplay image and said, Pretty. What means it? It was the first time in nearly six months that Stefan had heard a local ask a question not directly related to trading. Minimal fluency he had expected. Intellectual curiosity, if such it could be called, was something new. Without pausing to wonder why he was bothering to reply, he struggled to explain something of the subtle nature of a wordplay. She did not understand. That was not surprising. Had she comprehended even his childishly simple explanation, he would immediately have passed her along to the scientific staff as an exemplar of Alouette acumen. On the indigenous scale of intelligence, she doubtless qualified as quite bright. About at the level of a human eight-year-old, only without any book learning to draw upon. It was unlikely she would grow any smarter. But as the months progressed, she did, or at least her vocabulary increased. Struggling with the most fundamental concepts, she did everything he asked for, from laboriously dragging trade goods into the back chamber to be sorted, cataloged, pre-priced, and packaged for shipment off-world, to making suggestions to visiting locals about what goods the strange, dry-skinned folk preferred and would pay well for. It was funny to see how the other natives deferred to her. Even mature males, thick of tentacle and sharp of eye, seemed to shrink slightly in her presence. For a wild moment, he thought she might have some kind of local equivalent of royalty, much as the notion of an Alouette princess seemed a contradiction in terms. Below Lormance, one of the xenologists assured him that would not be the case. In the nearly 20 years there's been a human presence on Aurelis, No evidence has surfaced of any level of government above that of an extended family or clan. 
They haven't even achieved the tribal level yet. They're just starting to emerge from the hunter-gatherer stage. Below had a nice voice, Stefan used. About the nicest voice on Aurelis. And unlike most of the scientists, she was nearly the same age as he was. They were sitting together on one of the elevated walkways built atop Bellumina pilings that had been driven down through the water and muck into the reluctant bedrock below. Aurelis' sun, redder than that of his homeworld, was setting beyond red and yellow fiber thrush, the light peeking through the fronds to eliminate the station's sealed together, prefabricated modules. Below was almost as reflective as the metal walls, he decided. A sound sounded behind them, plaintive yet insistent. Stefan, what should I do with Kaja bulls just buying today? He looked around irritably. They go in the back on the bottom shelves on the right-hand side. You know that, Uluk. Her tone did not change, and she had no expression to alter. Yes, Stefan, I will make it so. It took her several minutes to slip-slide back inside. He returned to contemplating the sunset, the violet underside of the evening cumulus filling his head with thoughts that did not belong in as unpleasant a place as the outpost. I hear that you're leaving the station. She nodded. Sabbatical. On Renal 5. To consolidate my reports, put some into book form, give lectures, that sort of thing. I think I'll be back to start in on my advanced work. There's a lot of these creatures that we don't know. Is there that much more to learn? When she did not comment, he added, How do I know you're coming back, Belle? Because I say so. Because my work is here. He peered deep into her eyes. Perspiration glistened on her forehead and cheeks. She was wet, tired, unkempt, and beautiful. Is that the only reason? She turned away from him to the sunset. I'm not sure yet, she replied candidly. I like you, Stefan. I like you a lot, but I'm so deep into my work that much of the time I feel like I'm drowning. Drown in me, he told her with more intensity than he intended. Her hand slipped sideways to cover his. Maybe when I come back, she told him frankly, when I have more confidence in my own future, then... Maybe we'll see. You're a little young for me, Stefan. I'm not that young. When he reached for her, she leaned away, laughing affectionately. No, not now. As sweaty as we are, if we hold each other too tightly, we're liable to slip right past each other and into the water. He laughed too and settled for squeezing her hand and waiting for the alien sun to finish its day's work. He sweated out another six months, her absence made all the more frustrating by his having to deal with Uluk. Just when it seemed she was acquiring some real skill, she would do something supremely stupid. He was forced to reprimand her, sigh in exasperation, and explain the procedure all over again. She would listen patiently, indicate understanding, go along fine for a while, and eventually repeat the same mistake. Something about the Alawap seemed to render them incapable of retaining any pattern of information for more than a few weeks at a time. It was as if the entire species was afflicted with attention span deficit disorder. To make matters worse, he had to endure the endless jokes and gags that the rest of the staff enjoyed at his expense. His only compensation was the occasional reluctant approving grunt from Administrator Mori who recognized the strain his most junior employee was operating under, plus praise from the scientific staff. The behaviorists, in particular, would seek him out only to query him endlessly about his conversations with the Alawip. Look, he would object in exasperation, we don't have conversations. I give the thing orders and she carries them out, except when she forgets what to do, which is all the time, and I have to explain them all over again, slowly, and repeatedly, in the simplest terms possible. But within these restraints, a much older xenologist had pressed him, the native in question is capable of performing the complex tasks she's assigned to you? Sure, he said. 
if you can call stacking carvings and sorting bullhorns complex. Anything that involves actual thinking, I have to guide and help her with. Initiative doesn't exist among the Alouat, except when it involves food and shelter. I personally don't think they have any understanding of the concept. Yet, the other locals obviously respect her deeply, the persistent scientist had insisted. Sure, Stefan agreed. She's big stuff because she has a job in the House of Wonders that stands in water and speaks freely to the visitors from the cloud rafts. I suppose, he conceded, that gives her some kind of rank or status that raises her up a notch or two above her fellow weed munchers. A few such carefully chosen comments were usually sufficient to send the behaviors on their contemplative way, muttering to themselves. One nice thing about Stefan's assistant, as far as Mori was concerned, was that the native never questioned her status. She accepted payment and trade goods, never asked for a change in the amount or kind of remuneration, worked silently and steadily, and was a real help in communicating the wants of the human traders to the natives. She slept in an old concentrate barrel Perv had wielded to one of the voluminous stilts, just above the waterline. Each morning she would ooze out of the plastic cylinder, drop into the water to clean herself, and then squirm up the ramp that had been erected to provide her kind with easy access to the station. With their strong tentacles, the Alwood could easily climb a ladder, but that would not allow them to bring goods into or take them out of the outpost. Stefan had despaired of ever seeing below again. Then, one day slightly less than a month before his tour was up, and he was due to be promoted off-world. Suddenly, she was there, having arrived without notice on the monthly shuttle. They did not exactly fall into each other's arms, not with customs officials and everyone else watching, but their eyes met, spoke, and smiled. Certain decisions were reached without the use of words. I told you I'd come back. She whispered to him later that morning. To resume your work? He left the question hanging, too fearful to add the other question he was burning to ask. To do that, yes, and perhaps, she added mischievously, to attend to other matters. I'm finished here in a few weeks. They were standing in the outpost, its familiar hothouse surroundings for once the equal and not the excess of what he was feeling inside. The company has offered me promotion from apprentice and my choice of positions on civilized world at a proper salary. I have a lot of flexibility. Hmm. That does open certain possibilities, doesn't it? For example, I've taken a lectureship on Matthewson 3. His expression did not change. There are two company operations on Matthewson, big ones. She nodded thoughtfully. Then she leaned forward, kissed him once adequately, and almost ran from the room. He remained behind, dazed and relieved and overflowing with satisfaction. Behind him, a familiar odor preceded a question. Stefan is happy? His expression fell. The wondrous contentment rushed away like water out of, a out of the bottom of a broken jar. Yes, Uluk, Stefan happy. Stefan go away soon. Go away? Crescent pupils swam within disc-like eyes. Why, Stefan, go away? It's time to go, he muttered irritably. All skyfolk eventually go from Morellis. Go back to home? At her uncomprehending silence, he added, Back to home raft. She considered this. Outpost not Stefan's raft? No, damn it. Did, don't you have something to do? Yes. I forget. Lifting his eyes heavenward, he moved to check the de duty scans for the day. But nothing, not even Alawat dullness, could entirely diminish the joy of Bell's return. The next several weeks passed in a haze that was more a consequence of his re-establishing his relationship with Bellow than of the heavy atmosphere. They spoke of her science and his business, and how the two might complement each other on a world like Matthewson III. When it was clear that the positives outweighed the negatives, their delight was mutual. Though young, they were both very practical people. When it was time to go, to finally leave behind Aurelis and its miasmatic swamps, Buggrid and Savannahs, 
melancholy atmosphere and multifarious stinks and smells. It was almost an anticlimax. Complaining a little less than usual, Administrator Morey was there to see them both off and to wish them well. The grumpy old company man was unable to look his former apprentice in the face for fear of giving away an actual smile. Purvisatha was long gone, having been promoted ahead of Stefan, but several others among the scientific and commercial community, who had established friendships with the personable young trader on his way up, turned out to see the two of them off. They were waiting for the skimmer that would ferry them out to a distant shuttle site, an artificial island built out in the middle of a spacious lake. When it occurred to Stefan that something was missing, a certain stench. Funny, he mused aloud. I thought she'd come to say goodbye. She? Below's tentative tone mimicked one he himself had used some time ago. My native assistant, an Alawa named Uluk. You met her, or at least you've encountered her. Oh, yes, of course. I only saw her a couple of times. She was usually working in the rear storeroom whenever I came into the outpost. He found himself searching the station's walkways, then the grubby muck below. I thought she'd be here, he shrugged. Oh well, no matter. She probably forgot. Turning back to below, he smiled affectionately. After a year here, I don't know how I'll cope with a normal Earth-type climate. I give you about two days to become fully acclimated, she replied softly. Henderson came huffing and puffing down the walkway. Reaching out, the panting behaviorist caught his breath as he shook first the apprentice's hand, then Bellows. Wanted to wish both of you luck. I'm sure you won't need it. Stefan nodded his thanks, looked past the scientist. Say, you haven't by any chance seen Ulick around today. He hesitated slightly. I sort of wanted to say goodbye. Your native assistant? Henderson's expression fell. Oh, I... Thought you knew. They found her yesterday about half a kilometer from the station on Islet 12. Dead. Self-inflicted killing wound, the biologists tell me. Sorry. A very strange feeling tightened in the younger man's gut. The longer he thought about it, the worse it got. That's too bad. I wonder what happened. Henderson cast a quick glance in Below's direction before replying. Though much younger, she was a fellow scientist, after all, and the incident was an interesting comment on indigenous behavioral patterns. You really didn't know, did you? No. You wouldn't, always paying attention to commerce and trade balances and the like. An Alouette's individual focus is on its extended clan. Alpha males and females, beta juniors, and so on. Didn't you ever notice that Uluk was never seen interacting with a family grouping? Stefan looked blank. You're right, I, I didn't. But I never thought about it. She lived at the station. That was her choice. Mr. Morey, myself, everyone else, we all thought that was her choice. Oh, it, it was, it was. Henderson hastened to assure him. I spoke to her several times, you know, as part of my work, he added almost apologetically. You didn't realize that instead of one of her own kind, she had chosen to focus on you. The apprentice eyed the behaviorist uncertainly. On me? Why would I notice something like that? Below's response was more understanding. Are you saying that this Uluk individual chose to imprint herself on Stefan in lieu of a Norma Alwat extended family grouping? They work together almost every day. Henderson looked apologetic as he regarded the younger man. I thought surely you must have perceived something, or... I would have mentioned it to you. It makes for a very interesting case history. Stefan swallowed hard. You're not saying that in some crazy kind of way she got uh, attached to me or anything weird like that. In his mind, he conjured up an image of the misshapen, slimy alien. But for some reason, it did not repulse him quite as much as it once had. He found himself scanning the vegetation of the distant, fetid swampland. He remembered how Uluk had hovered around him, lingering in his vicinity, even when her work was done, watching him operate the projector and the viewers, asking questions to which he was sure she already knew the answers. 
how she was always there waiting for him in the mornings, and then reluctantly when it was time for her to retire to her barrel under the outpost. He thought about how he had treated it, her, with casual indifference, even contempt. Memories of the time he had spent in her company came flooding back to him. They did not make him feel better. Surely he wasn't responsible. He forced himself to ask as much. Henderson considered. Your announcement that you were leaving permanently no doubt came as a shock. In the absence of any other extended family connection, it's not uncommon for an Alouette to opt for self-termination instead of attempting to impose himself on another family or clan. You're saying, Below ventured, that what happened was something like a dog pining away for its master? Well, hardly. Henderson drew himself up slightly. The Alouette may be a little slow on the uptake, but they're far from unaware. He turned back to the suddenly silent, staring apprentice. It's not your fault, you know. Happens all the time with these clans. Self-termination is a well-documented means of controlling the population and maintaining the available food supply. I know. Stefan pushed away the sad thoughts. It's too bad she was nice enough, except for the smell. I can't help it if she was somehow attracted to one of the sky people. To me. The oddest sensation was spreading through him. It made him angry, but try as he might, he found he could not suppress it. <laughs> attracted? Henderson stared at him. You really didn't perceive much, did you? Uluk wasn't attracted to you. We spoke about many such things, and I remember quite clearly that she told me once she thought you were the ugliest living thing she had ever set eyes upon, even uglier than any of the other humans she had met. That's why she stayed at the outpost so long and close to you. She felt it was something she needed to do. And then when you ignored her and what she was doing for you, well, I guess she felt that all her efforts on your behalf were being rejected. Rejected? Stefan frowned. Do doing for me? I was tolerating her. What did you think she was doing for me? Wiping his eyes, the behaviorist blinked back the unforgiving rays of the setting ultraviolet sun. She didn't stay close to you because she was attached to you, Stefan. She stayed because she felt sorry for you. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully you enjoyed our program as much as I enjoyed reading the story for you. We will be back two weeks from today, and that should be on the 18th of March. I hope you'll join us then. Have a wonderful rest of the day.